All right, we got the recording going. How many of you had a chance to go back and review the YouTube video? I'll put the link out. If that worked for you, uh, just give me a thumbs up. I'm going to try to do that with this and post it so you could go back and read it, uh, listen to it, and put some postmarks in there for you so you could sift through it. You don't have to sift through or go through all the other stuff. So um, let's go ahead and get this thing started. Uh, your cohort leaders, you got anything in there? I don't know which which one so you are. If you have anything, you need to say something. Go ahead at this time. If not, we're going to keep it moving. All right, cool. All right, all right. So this is where we are today. This is our agenda. We're going to finish up with these process groups and domains. Um, we're gonna the case study. Don't worry about that. I realized I gave you the wrong one when I went back um, shuffling all the documents. Oh, by the way, did you guys get the link to get into the drive to get all those documents? All right, cool. Uh, we're gonna I'm gonna cover some of those isms again. I got a couple more for you, and then we'll jump into monitoring, controlling, and uh, closing. Uh, and then we'll talk about a little bit, do a recap on the process domains. Then I have a quick little quick fire quiz for you, like five, 10 questions. We'll probably do that in the second hour when you come back just to um, get the juices flowing a little bit and I give you homework. So I've already talked to Jay. Uh, I would, I will not meet with you Friday. However, I will send you an assignment for you to do on your own. Uh, because uh, I'm under the impression that everybody has their 35 hours. When you say that, that means you have a baseline understanding of the project management uh, framework and, and know your way around. So right now we're just doing a review. So uh, I'm just reviewing and making sure we hit the main point. So I have a good assignment for you to do um, for this assignment and then to carry you on through the weekend and I'll give you some guidance. Uh, you have enough work to keep you busy um, and versus coming on here with me for three for, for the time being. So our statement, this is it. You got to put it all together and apply it to a project. Straight to the point. That's what you have to do on that exam. They're going to throw scenarios at you, various questions to test your knowledge, not your experience. It's a difference. Your knowledge of the material, that's what they're testing. So don't, don't try to apply your experience uh, to a question because that's how they are designed to flip if you do that. Before we start, I just want to highlight some things. I've had some meetings with some people, some of your uh, cohort members the last couple, couple of days. Get the link, get on the schedule. I just wanted to see how you guys respond. So we got a good response. I'm already booked out till May. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm a open up another day or so once I adjust my schedule, as I get more time, I'll open that up and I'll let you guys know what um, we can meet one-on-one. -on -one. You have to be intentional and deliberate to pass this exam. I'm going to be real with you and those who, who, who met me over the last couple of days, you got to go hard in the paint. You, no TV, no extra stuff, don't waste no time, no Netflix, no Facebook. You got to put your face in this book and immerse yourself in this material. That's it. I, I'm, I'm not here to sugarcoat it for you. You guys are in a, in a, in a select group. Uh, they're expecting some things out of you, and I'm here to, to get you riled up and get you focused on this, right? Um, I, that, that's just it. Um, and, and we're at this point where I think we've already broke the ice. We kind of know each other. Now I'm going to open up, and I'm going to give you the real deal. I'm not here to put some fancy slides in front of you and make you feel good about this training. You don't need good training. You need intelligence to help you pass this exam. That's what you need. And that's what I'm trying to give you. So you have to focus and be intentional about your study times. You have to be intentional about 
what you're reading, how much you're reading, what materials are you using. You have to be deliberate about all of that. Just like you are in your job, you have to go in on this exam the right way. And I'm showing you this because I want to get in your head a little bit. This is why people fail. Not enough prep, underestimating, false confidence, test anxiety, only using free sources, information overload, trying to memorize the pin box, right? This is what you want to stay away from. If you got test anxiety, you need to practice. Practice makes improvement. Practice builds confidence, right? That's how you get rid of text anxiety. You put yourself in those simulations and scenarios. You said 30 minutes on the clock. I told you, you got a minute and 27 seconds per question. You should be able to knock out 15, 20 questions in that amount of time, right? You got to put yourself in these simulations. So when you go into testing, there's no test inside of you because you done did it a thousand times already, all right? You, you've done it. Um, so these are the numbers I picked. These, there's no official numbers because I know people always ask me this and I want to put this in your head now. This is what I got off of some of PMI stuff and other bloggers and PMP trainers out there. 30 out of 100 people who take this test pass. If you do the math, that's, you know, 30%. 50% is another figure. Half of the people fail it the first time. They have, and then the passing score. People want to know what's the passing score. If you look to your right, there's no score. You got to beat that target. I don't know what that target line is, but you need to answer enough questions to get past that target line. And if you do, you pass. No matter if you're on the far right, in the middle of, of, of the, uh, you know, the third quarter, you got to get past the halfway. That's all you need to do is pass, right? So don't think you got to get ace this test. Don't try to do that unless you know this material really, really well. With those numbers I've come up with, we want all of y'all to pass, but it's going to depend on you, how intentional and how deliberate you are with your studies. Um, we cannot take the test for you. We're providing the material. We're providing the training. We're providing the guidance. That's when I say, do you have a question? And nobody answers the question. I know there's some questions out there. Yes, right? I, I have a question. Chris. Okay. So... I know the test is 180 questions. Do we, do you take all 180 or is it just up to 180? No, it's 180 questions. Five of those questions are experimental. So you're going to take all the questions. Any question you don't answer, you're going to get it counted wrong against you. So you need to answer all the questions. Okay, I have a question. Go for it. All right, so what about, okay, is there a situation where, because I have taken certification before that, they didn't allow me to see all the questions. Once I did enough to pass, they just logged me out of the system. Even though I have not, I have not reached the end of the questions. So they didn't allow me to do the, the old questions. So is PMP different? Would they allow me to take the old 180 questions or they would just log me out once I pass the, the thing? No, what would I? No, they won't do that. Okay, that's not how yeah. that's because in CISSP, they'll just log you out once you, yeah, no, no, you, they, that's, I mean, that's not the case. Okay. If it's changed, I don't think that's the case. No, oh, okay. that's not the case. Okay, okay, uh, they keep it, keep it going. Somebody else, uh, Juliet, real quick. I see Juliet, you had your hand up here. I'm able to, yes, yes. So okay. I want to make sure I have this timing accurate. We have approximately one minute and 27 seconds per question. Right. Yeah, yeah, I just did. I mean, that's just my swag math. I thought for four, four hours, 180, you do the math. That's mm -hmm. how I came up with that. Don't, that's not, that's how I came up with that. So you could do the same thing. Uh, and you could do it with your questions. So, so I give you that metric. So if you do 30 questions, then you should figure out how soon, if you're wasting too much time trying to think into the question, or you're being efficient with your time and answering a question, moving on. If you don't know it, mark it, move on. Uh, and so that's why I tell you guys that. So you could use that as a metrics to help you calculate your speed and your efficiency on the exam. Because when you go for that first break, from what I hear, 
is that you have to be done with what you finished that first half because this is a schedule breaks mm -hmm. before you could just break and come back to it which you could anybody could just go to the bathroom so they don't do that anymore so they have hard breaks and once you're done you got to be done with everything and then you come back and you finish the rest of the test so um cool so uh like i said we want all you guys to pass and uh, this is this is the deal that's what it's going to look like those are the numbers uh, 10 to 17 percent is what i came up with so you guys do the math put in the work prove me wrong um prove this is just a, it's just a statistic prove me wrong so here's this is going to be a slide you get this this is what i came up because even in those meetings one-on-ones i've had the question was, Chris, I need a study plan. I, it's a lot of information. Which direction do I go? This is it. This is based off of 21 days, right? This is 21 days. No days off. So it's a 21-day framework that I put together for you. And this might not work for everybody. And it depends on your lifestyle and what you're doing. But based off of my, what, what I suggested is you go, you go in on this. Tell the wife, tell the husband, hey. I need 21 days. I'm trying to do this. Cut me some slack. Help me out. And, and that's what how it went down in my household. So be intentional. Read the covering pig block, pin block guide. Get you a study guide. If you have this, use it. That's the reader's book. Use it. Learn the concepts. Don't try to memorize. You've heard me say that plenty of times before. Immerse yourself in the material. Quickest way to learn a language. You're learning a new language. You need to, if you go to Japan or you go to South America, you don't know Spanish, you spend six months there, you're going to start speaking the, speaking the language. All right. That's what you have to do with this. Uh, read, review, take short quizzes throughout the day, five in the morning, 10 in the, in the middle of the day, 15 in the evening, along with going back and reading and reviewing the questions that you got wrong. Your goal is to get to a thousand questions and study. That means you've gone and you've seen, you've went through a thousand practice questions and the ones you got wrong, you was able to go back and study. And you do that for 21 days, about an average of 25 questions per day, three practice exams throughout that duration. So you figure out how you wanna divide that up. I can't tell you that you got, but this is the working framework and this will get you your time, but you gotta go face in the book, put the blinders on and get it done. Um, and because this is, if you're going for sec plus, net plus, A plus, I've done all those too. The same track you guys are doing, I've done it, but I did it on my own, you know? And that's what you have to do with, with this here, but at, at more intense than those other ones you can knock out in, in a week. I just wanted to give that to you guys. Um, we'll save the quick fire uh, for later. I just want to give you that, um, just to kind of get your attention, right? Uh, get, and I've been talking to Jay about it and, and what I've been seeing, and I'm giving him feedback. You know, I'm seeing things and I'm hearing things. So um, I'm rooting to make sure you guys have enough time to study, and, and, and we're talking about that. So he he will talk to you guys about that uh, later. Let me look in the chat, make sure I didn't miss anybody. Ba, 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 ba. Thanks, Juliet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was angry to schedule a meeting in April. Okay, I'll try to open some more up in the middle before April ends. So if you want to do a one on one, I'll look at my schedule and I open them up and I send a message out. So, uh, all right, cool. Any questions off of what I said? We're good? Awesome, awesome. PMI-isms, this is in the reader's book on pages uh, 16 and 17. Um, you, you don't have to go there. It's just like me reading a scripture out of the Bible here and out just to get you guys motivated. So just listen to what I'm saying. Project managers have all the power described in the PMBOK guide and perform all the stated activities or have made proactive tailoring decisions. What does that mean? That means when you're on the test, you are working in a perfect world. You got all the resources you need. All your team members are doing their jobs. The stakeholders are doing what they're supposed to do. So don't 
second guess the process. It's not your job where people don't do their job. It's not your job where you have no authority. So don't get sucked into that. You working in a perfect environment when you on that exam. So keep that in your head. Don't second guess, well, do they have this? Well, do I have this? No, you have it. If you ask yourself that question, you have it. Uh, stakeholders are involved throughout the project. Their needs are taken into account while planning project and creating communications management plan and a stakeholder engagement plan. Whether it be plan-driven, hybrid, or agile, or, or, or agile, stakeholders there, in the predictive world, they say, hey, you have to cater to the customer, make the customer happy. Same way in uh, the agile world, your job is to, what can you do for the customer? If the customer wants this, hey, you want this? Okay, well, let's see how we can use you. Always are thinking in an optimistic mindset and leaning forward to be proactive to get the stakeholders and sponsors what they want. The project management plan is realistic and everybody believes it can be achieved. So don't doubt the plan as you as you build it and you work it out, you just push it through. Everybody has buy-in. Don't think like, oh, we planned this, it's not gonna work. No, you, no, you planned it, it's gonna work. And you're gonna make adjustments by either submit and change requests to alter your, your plan uh, if you're in a predictive environment or if you're working in an agile environment, you can make those changes on the fly because you have your product owners and the customer or and yourself uh, working in collaboration, unlike in a plan-driven world where you have to go through, submit, you, you have to assess to see how it's going to affect the project then you come up with a course of action and then you submit a request then that request goes to the project management change control board it gets approved or disapproved it comes back to the team it gets logged it's either a go or no go if it's a go you work it back into the plan you adjust your baselines you adjust your scope baseline if it affects it you adjust your budget if it affects it, and you adjust your timeline if it, if it affects it, and you continue with the project. If it's not approved, you just continue forward with what you have done, what you have planned, and you make adjustments as, as you can and see fit. And if you have errors, then you will log that data and report it to the stakeholders. And that's it for the isms. Uh, so just, just keep those in mind. You can go back to and watch this on the video. I have this bookmark um, so you could go straight back to it. So we're in executing, monitoring, and closing. And this is in Pin by Guide 6. Pin by Guide 6 starting on page 595. So I'm going to give you a minute or so. Please get there if you have your book. Follow along with me so you can see this. I want you to see this. And once everybody has your book up, just give me a thumbs up. Nice, nice, nice. I see, I see some thumbs up. Y'all, what's y'all cameras off? Give me some thumbs ups. Hope y'all have y'all books with y'all. <laughs> There you go. I got you, James. I see you, James. Walter Giles, Bridget. That was 595, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. And all right, all right, all right. I see you. I see you. There you go. Give me a thumbs up emoji. All right, let's go. Let's take off. All right. Execution, a process group. Someone tell me, someone tell me in which of the process groups most of the work is done. 
or just put it in execution. Execution. There, execution. there we go. There we go. Yes, execution. yes, 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 yes. All right. All right. This, this is where all the, this is where all the, the magic happens, right? This is where all the magic happened uh, right here in execution, you know, it's perform process of perform to complete the work defined in a project management plan to satisfy the project requirements. We made the plan. Let me back up a little bit. We got a charter. We had a kickoff meeting. Excuse me. Project manager was assigned. Kickoff meeting was made. We made a plan, right? We built this big plan for this project. Now we're about to execute what we plan. And this is what this is all about. Step-by-step, step, uh, deliverable by deliverable. As far as our work, somebody tell me what process did we execute to develop the work on a project? Planning. Within the planning phase. So within the planning phase, there's a part of it and that we have processed through to figure out what the deliverables are, how long it's gonna take for each. The work breakdown. Piece of, there we go, ding, 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 go the start. Dubious. There we go, go start, go start. Work breakdowns. And then before that, what do we need in order to create a WBS? Ms. Cole? Correct. Good job. Good job. That's what we need. So without a scope, without the charter, we can't go into scope development. And without the scope, we can't go into developing a schedule. And that helps us break out the WBS. And then what leads us to what? Uh, you said? I said after we've got we've received the scope mm -hmm. and we the charter the scope and we've worked out the WBS, what's the next item of the iron triangle that we go to for we next? Um, the schedule. Are you looking for the baseline or the what if you need the WBS packets? Missionary. So we find activities. Okay, okay. We're done with that part. We're in the next knowledge area, actually. After the scope has been completed, what's the next knowledge area? Oh, that is a uh, uh, that's a schedule. Schedule management. The schedule management, right? Yeah, and we when we worked out the schedule, it's cost. And cost. There we go. Cost. cost there, we go. there we go. Yeah. There we go. So you need you need you need you need a schedule with the work so you could work out the budget. You can't have a budget until you figure out what yes. the work is going to be. You can't figure out what the work is going to be until you have a scope. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm just trying to back this up to, to let you guys see how linear this predictive process is. Uh, when it comes to planning. Now on the agile side of the house, they're not using a WBS or WBS dictionary. What are we using in an agile environment? Sizing. It's called management plan. Cool. Burn down charts. All right, stop, 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 stop. Listen mm -hmm. to what I'm saying. Agile. In predictive world, we say, WBS and we use proto backlog. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Yeah, you, there we go. You you on the right track. So we use what? Proto backlog, spring and backlog, spring backlog, breakdown. There we go. And we got stories, epics, stories and epics. Stories and that's how you talk. Stories. That's how you define the work in the agile world versus predictive. So when you hear backlog, product backlog epics, story cards, that might give you some inclination that you are, 
that question or that scenario is putting you in an agile, unpredictive environment, all right? So that's why the lexicon is important. Words mean things, right? Uh, so that's why your lexicon, uh, you're learning a new language. You don't know this PMI language. If you're in the military, uh, you spend some time, whether you, whichever branch you're in, we have what we call a military decision-making process. It's a, a planning framework where all the officers get in a room and plan it, but I was lucky as the SF operator, that's how we plan our missions because we support division and brigade commanders. You know, So we gotta be able to speak their language as NCOs uh, and, and that's what we do. So it's the same thing with this. You need to speak PMI's language. That's why you have the lexicon. The lexicon is their language book so you can speak their language. Here's some of the executing process processes in uh, in this execution uh, group. On page on page five ninety seven, um, I was talking to one of your cohort members, and it was like, "Hey, you know what, man? I'm a visual guy. I like to see the graphics. This book, in these graphics, in these books, if you don't want to read, this is a good way." If you could decipher the picture, then that's good. The picture is telling you a story. You don't have to read it. Um, but what I wanted to highlight in here, what you see here are the different processes in it. So as you flip through this, we got direct and managed project work. Um, it gives us some examples of the documents. And, and this, what is good about this part of the book, it doesn't overwhelm you with so much text and so much detail. This is the high level look at all these process groups, right? And so this is a good place for you to come back here and just review a section really quick and get an understanding of what's going on in each process group. On this exam, you don't need, you need to be wide as possible and shallow. You don't need to go narrow and deep on this on this study because you're going to spend so much time focusing on this one thing that you're going to get everything else wrong so you need to broaden your horizons and if you've watched all the videos and you've heard me say it it's at a high level meaning top level stuff don't get in the weeds on this stuff you know what's what's the task what's the process what do i need to get it done what are the tools I need? Who do I need to talk to? How do I get more money? How do I change the scope? How do I revise the project product? How do I get this deliverable out to the customer? Um, how do I procure things? You know, what is the contract process? You just need to know just enough about all these subjects to get across that, that middle line when you take in this exam. So directing project work, manage a project, a knowledge, manage quality, acquire resources, develop team, manage communications, so on and so forth, all the way to page 611, right? Um, and so let's go back and look at some things. And because I know folks want to know this and if you look here, let's go back to direct and manage project work, and you go down to section 4.1.2 project documents examples. This corresponds with page 55, is it 559? Or yeah, I think 559 or 595. That shows the project documents and uh, project plans. And so that's where these things are coming from. And there's a set of documents and plans for each of these that's some type of input and then some type of output uh, is happening. Uh, and so these are the most common inputs uh, and outputs. The tools and techniques are like, listen, listed here because uh, I just want to get you in these. And, and then when you get into um, section one of the PMBOK guide, the actual PMBOK 
itself, it goes more in detail with the actual tools for each process. But for right now, everybody worries about all the ITTOs, but if you learn these common themes, somebody tell me what EEF, what is EEF and, and tell me about them. How do, how does how how do they affect our projects? EEF is environmental fact. I'm sorry, environmental factors. Um, that has to do with external pressure. So that could be maybe some new laws that, that was passed. That could be maybe a competitor. Um, that could be maybe some constraints was placed on maybe like the community or the neighborhood or there's been some pressures from things like that, maybe okay. the media or things like that. So those are external, um, are there any, any internal, internal factors? EFs are external there factors, not organic, not organic to the project. So project. they could be... Yeah, yeah. So not organic to that to, to that project that we're that we're talking about. It could be other projects, you know. Could be uh, it could be anything that is not organic to that project that in, in question. So those could be see that external factors. Uh, sorry, that price environment factors. Okay, great. You were right on the you're on the right track. So let's let's recalibrate that a little bit. Mm -hmm not in control of the project team. So those EEFs are things that the project team cannot control. control. It's out of our control, right? They could be mm -hmm. internal or external. Laws and all those things, vendors, their supplies are messed up. We can't control that. We can't control that. Uh, anything with, because those EEFs could be within the company, but it could be another department or we're not in charge of it. So. We don't have control over this. So those are internal and external. Somebody tell me about OPAs. What's OPAs? And they're organizational assets, process assets, like, you know, knowledge base, lesson learned, that all the documentation they've had from previous projects that they put together to help future exactly. projects. Exactly, exactly. Anything that's going to help us do our work and or is going to be a resource. And, and just like Ron said, you know, those things are the things going to be organizational process assets. Like they're an asset to us. That could be the PMO. That could be things from the PMO. Uh, another key term, ding, ding, ding. Make sure you know about the PMO and the key term there. So EEFs and OPAs are probably, I would say like, as you look through this, they're probably about 50% or more of the processes, these two are gonna show up. And then you might have updates to OPAs or updates to EEFs, right? As an output, right? Something might happen and they might do an update. Uh, the project management plan is another common input to a lot of the predictive side when you talk about processes. Project documents could be anything, any one of those documents off of that list on page uh, five, five, I think it's 559 is the page number, any of those documents. And then on the flip side of it as an output, you can have a change request uh, or you can have updates to those project documents. So say you had a change request to readjust the budget. We submitted a change request. We, we made our justification. We said a change request, project management change control board. It comes back, we log it, and then we update our, our, our cost baseline, and then we update the plan. So project documents could be one or more things. It's just a larger document, it's just a blanket. So that's why it's important that you know what's on that page because there can be an, an item like, hey, all of these are project plans except what? They could have, you know, scope management plan, communications management plan, scope, scope baseline, and then they might have 
something um, uh, that's a docket, a document, like a risk register. So you throw that one out because it's not a it's not a plan. It's a document. The other three are plans. The other one is document. So that's why it's important to know that. So monitoring, controlling. Let's hit there. My, any questions about uh, execution? And as you look through there, you'll see those examples. Like I see, you'll see EEFs. If you flip through each one, input, 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 input. And almost every one of these processes in execution, there's an EPA, EPA or EEF as an input or both. And some of them are outputs. Uh, once you go through that process. So this is a good place to come and do a quick, quick read. You see it's not that many places, uh, pages. Uh, so that's what you need. You just need to review, get some knowledge really quick, get back to testing, right? Get back to testing, get back to uh, figuring out your gaps and your knowledge. So monitoring controlling is on page 613, a process required to track, review, and regulate the process and performance of the project. Identify any areas in which changes to the plan are required and initiate the corresponding changes. So a good question that was posed to me was like, Chris, does execution and monitoring controlling happen at the same time or they're right behind another? Think of that as once the plan is start, the, the, the train is rolling, you're watching and checking, watching and checking. So this is happening simultaneously. When something starts, you're watching and checking, making sure, or maybe you need to wait until after a certain segment of that process is complete or that task is complete for say that work, that work package, uh, you know, and wait until that is complete and you might do an evaluation and monitoring. And the controlling part is you submitting a change request. The controlling part is conducting the inspection. And so inspections are a tool that you can use to make sure that the work is done properly. So inspections are a tool for you to make sure quality is where it needs to be. And uh, you're checking to see everything as, as going as planned. And that's what's going on. So monitoring controlling is happening uh, simultaneously. Controlling is comparing actual performance with plan performance and analyzing the variance, assessing trends to affect process improvements. So you're looking at what we planned in our in our in our war room, that is a term. Just let you know who who knows what the war room is. That's a real PMI term. Think about it. I got a war room at my house too. You might call right, it your yeah. lab. You might call it your lab, man yeah. cave. Where well, everything <laughs> goes down. Yeah, that's where we. That's where all the all the business and all the brains and all the plans happen. So the war room is where the project teams hangs out and uh, they they talk amongst themselves. That's where they go to discuss, talk about the project and talk about all the stakeholders they don't like. That's what they do. They go to the war room. That's the <laughs> right, right. That's what that's what you do in the war room. That's what they do. But. Uh, uh, that's what you're doing. You're evaluating what you plan as a team, and then you see what's going on, and then you're analyzing the performance to see where the variance is. Are we behind schedule? Are we ahead of schedule? Are we, you know, busting our budget? Are we under budget? And so those are the things you're looking for uh, and in uh, and and that monitoring, controlling, and that's what that 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 section and my process group is all about. So, page six fifteen, same thing. Monitor, excuse me. Monitoring control project work. 
This is the first one, as you can see right there, the inputs, project plan, project documents, work performance, information, agreements, enterprise, EEFs, and OPAs. Somebody tell me um, about the string of data when it comes to work performance. Um, there's two more elements that go along with work performance information. Somebody tell me what those are. And how the and how the flow is organized and and who gets what. So you guys could help each other. Somebody pick up the first part. Somebody tell me what's the first, the next two items that go along with that. It's a group of three. Work, work performance. performance data. There we go. What's that the next one? Okay, that's three. So we got three. So work performance data, work performance information, work performance reports. What comes first? The data. And then what do we do to the data? Analyze. Analyze. And, report, and, and we analyze the data to, to make what? Information report, inform, uh, performance information, right? And then that, that information is taken to build what? Create reports. Create reports to send to who? Uh, Stakeholders. Correct. So that's the string. We collect data through monitoring and controlling. We analyze the data. And the data doesn't become information until it's gone through a process that we have analyzed it to, to interpret the data. That becomes information for us. Though now we understand it. That stays with us and everybody close to the team. But then if we need to report that outside to stakeholders or customers or outside agencies, we have to build a report and to package it so they can interpret it. They don't need to know all the whiz bang figures and tap, tap terminology that we're using that's only particular to us. They need to know it so they can make a decision, right? You're making those reports so the stakeholder or the customer or the vendor can make a decision and, and it needs to be in a, in a format that they can interpret it and make that decision. So those are test items, testable items, work performance data, work performance information and work performance reports. Understand what they are, who they go to and what's the process uh, of getting them. So, hey, on the outputs, we got work performance reports, we got change requests, we got project management plan updates and project management documents updates. Um, uh, we got perform, perform integrated change control. Uh, that is making sure we, in a predictive environment, they don't want you making too many changes, right? Because we made this plan and this plan is supposed to be the holy grail and they don't want you making too much changes. So that's why you have to go through that process of how does it affect the project? What's the best course of action? What's the solution? Drop a justification, send it to the project management change control board and so on and so forth. So that's what, Change control is all about validating the scope, controlling the scope, you control the scope, you control the budget and your timeline by making a change, submitting and disapproving a request for changes, right? So you need to protect that in a predictive environment. They want few changes as possible. Uh, but in an agile sense, uh, that's okay. If you need to make a change, it's really easy because we're expecting change. We don't know all, we don't have all the answers. We don't know all the information. So it's okay to make some changes as long as they're uh, not too, too crazy. Uh, control costs, control resource, control quality, monitor communications, monitor risks. As you can see, there's a whole lot of monitoring going in. Monitor stakeholder engagement, how the stakeholders feeling. Is somebody pissed off with you? Did we piss somebody off? Um, how can we 
nurture that relationship and get it back on the good side. You know, those type of things. You're using your interpersonal skills to keep everything together. So page 613 to 632, you're going to have uh, that control and process group. These uh, are those inputs that I were talking about. Uh, we went over those uh, work. WPIs, WPDs, WPR, agreements, a change requests, and a project plan updates. Moving on to closing. This is super easy. Process form to formally complete the project or phase or contract, right? So if you're working in a full life cycle through all process groups where you're going to work through just one life cycle, then you will close. But if you have a project life cycle that has uh, multiple iterations, so you will be closing a phase or you have a phase gate that you close after something is complete. So you might do deliverable one in phase one, deliverable two in phase two, and so on and so forth. So that's what they mean about uh, project or phase. Uh, you're closing out and what's the thing what's the one thing we have to do especially at closing but also throughout the whole process ensure deliverables are, deliverables are complete okay what's the last thing you do before you close a project or a phase lessons learned correct definitely last at closing but you can also collect lessons learned in initiation and planning and execution and monitoring control. So pay attention to that. If you see that on an exam, that's low hanging fruit for you. Um, that'll be the trickery with, hey, when are you to collect lessons learned? As much as needed. But if there's an option there that speaks to closing, um, that's probably your best answer because they're both right. So you have to figure out what the question wants from you um, when it comes to that. And that's it. That's all you have to do is pro one, one process in that group, close project or phase. And these are some of the IT, the I and the O's that you use. Same things, ES, OPAs, our string of uh, data, information and reports and updates to EFs and OPAs, any change requests, complete those, and any project document updates. So let's take a break. I have a question before we take a break. Okay, yes, yes. For, for the closing process and some of the questions, um, I was getting the questions incorrect because of the deliverables being turned over um, you know, to the customer. But could you explain that a little bit? So, so give me a little bit of uh, insight with the question. You said because the deliverables were being turned over to the customer? Yes. So there were a few questions that I came, came into that were basically, I couldn't really, I wasn't sure, if, is this the end of the phase? Are we in execution or are we in closing? Well, well. So if, if not reading the question and not knowing, unless it states it's the final deliverable, um, mm. and then yes, you will move to closing. But if you completed the, so it's like you complete the deliverable mm -hmm. and you go right there, the deliverable is complete, you go back to the next one. You know, um, and, and any changes to update, but until it's accepted, once it's accepted, like all the deliverables, so if you have multiple, and that's why I say it depends on what the question, how the questions is framed, but once you have all the deliverables and the the stakeholders or custom, the sponsor signs off on it, then you can move to closing. So don't move to closing okay. until, you can't close a gate or phase or a project until you get, that's what you're looking for. That's the key thing. Accept it by the the sponsor or you know uh, product owner once it's accepted then you can 
in agile, we're not really closing. Um, we're just going to move to the next item in the product backlog, right? We're just going to just, we're just going to, we get that done. Hey, is that complete? All right, check, boom. And we get it done. We check to make sure everything is good. Okay, we do our uh, Scrum Master comes in. We do our review. We shake high five. And then we go back to playing the next sprint. And we keep the ball going, but we don't close yet. We still, we still have work to do because we might have to run two or three sprints. And, and essentially, if you look at it from a predictive perspective, um, you could look at that as each deliverable, you just one cycle, or you have to wait for it to come off the main line. Does that make sense? It, it does. Um, I think I just still need to- I have to see the more. question. Send me the, send me the question, because um, that's why I'm saying I'm trying to answer it, but I got to see what the question is saying. Okay, um, I'll do yeah, that. Send me, send me the question. Thanks. All right, you guys uh, take, take 10, and uh, if you want to- Shoot me a question in the chat and I and I get to that right away. Um, let's come back at uh, 37 after, wherever you are. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, Jay. All oh. right, awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, I just wanted, I didn't want to take up too much of your time. I'm actually, was at an event, a uh, military spouse fest uh we had like 250 spouses over here at the navy um navy army army and navy uh club country club which i've never been to mind you the the if you want to become a member it's like fifty thousand dollars so that's just not not the type of place I'll, I'll go to on the regular but uh they were doing a great thing so i just wanted out the support and, and give help to um, some of the spouses out there. Um, the one thing that I, I wanted to touch base with you guys with, and I kind of want to re reiterate this um, a little bit. When we speak to uh, Alpha, if you guys have questions, that is your time to, to make sure you ask. I would like each of the, the teams to come up with questions for them because they'll, they've will they been there, they've done everything that you did and you'll get a good understanding. The other aspect, um, and I'm gonna be 100% honest with you guys with this, uh, Though this is a certification cohort, it has nothing to do with certifications. Um, I had a conversation earlier and I was kind of talking about it. I usually wait a little bit to, to kind of talk about this, but this is really about your team and your community. Um, and if you didn't get that, um, I, I hope you understand that now. The reason why a lot of this stuff is, is very heavy tasking is because you can't do anything on your own. If you are an individual that's, that's not uh, essentially working with your team or collectively collaborating with your team, there's no way that you can get through this process. This is a very much a team sport. And so that is the reason why we kind of built it that way. It's, it's similar to any deployment you may have ever been on or for military spouses, when your spouse leaves, how uh, you have to kind of hunker down, work with the people that's close to you to kind of get things done. That's why this is like that. It's really being able to provide you with skill sets that you will get to you, uh, help you find opportunities, overcome her, uh, hurdles, and, and figure out what opportunities are out there for you. Now, the certifications and everything that we throw in there is meant that way, right? So it's to put some pressure on you to get things done. But collectively, I just want you guys to keep in mind and get, get, stay cognizant of this. If, if you are someone that's not pulling their weight on your team, you're affecting your whole team. So just keep that in mind because this, this definitely, from even from the alpha, those folks are now lifelong friends for some of these teams. And you may not feel that way, or you may, but I want people to understand that th there's a process to this and it's more than just a certification course. It's meant to really connect you with folks that you have to the left and right of you that are going through things just as you are, um, that have dealt with things just as you have, and collectively you guys are getting through this process together. Does everyone understand what I'm, I'm talking about? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. Does yes. anyone feel that, or have anyone has anyone experienced that so far? Experienced that in what way? Like the like as far as your teams, like teamwork. like there's a lot to get done, but you have people that are just doing things on your team that's just knocking things out, and you guys are are just flexing or working together to get it done. And it, does anyone experience that so far? Or no. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so that's that's what the course is really built off of, is built off of community. Um, so I just want to give you guys that touch base. But uh, continue to uh, do what you're doing. If you guys have any questions for me, please let me know. I will follow up with you um, as soon as I can. I am, as I said, I'm always doing something, but uh, I will definitely make time if you guys need to call me for anything. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this process and I really want you guys to succeed in everything you do, but I really wanna help you guys get there and uh, do it as a community. Cool. I'm driving. I'm sorry. But yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. I appreciate right. it. Hey, Chris, you got it. Sorry about it. All right, man. Thanks, man. Get out of my classroom. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Good, good, good. All right. All right. Let's, uh, this, this part will be short and then we'll jump into a little quick fire quiz, uh, like 10 questions or so, just to have some, uh, change it up. I just want to, uh, test a little thing really quick. So the domains, we've already talked about these people domains. Uh, these, this is your upper umbrella. I would say the process domains, uh, people, um, processes and business environment is the, the overarching of all of this. Um, you're dealing with people, um, you're dealing uh, with processes and you are dealing with folks in a business environment. So this is all coming from your exam content outline. Uh, have that by you when you're working through these tasks. If you want to break it down uh, and look and see if, if you're working in integration or which knowledge area you're working in, um, where that uh, where they overlap because they're overlapping. Uh, one thing I, I'm very, Pinball Guide 7, I've been reviewing it. It doesn't really give do a good job of uh, laying these things out for you. But the study guides, a reader's study guide, uh, I, there's a lot in there to unpack, um, but they mentioned um, the agile process. So what I'm trying to do is get something in front of you to give you a better understanding of how all this overlaps versus just saying just saying it. Uh, I have a I have another guy that I use for my long course, and, and that that does a good job of giving us some insight. Um, so you basically you learn these two pillars of of approach methodologies, predictive and agile, and then you have that in your head and when you're testing based off of the trigger words, you know which approach you have to take. So that's how that test is working, right? So there's not really, I haven't seen any defined literature that says, hey, this is what an agile looks like. Um, it's just like, you just gotta know the techniques, the approach, we're doing sprints instead of a long plan, we're doing uh, story points and you know product backlog versus a work breakdown schedule. Uh, we're doing things a little bit different. So I just wanted to touch on those again. Those are your pillar domains for uh, the, the exam. And let me, I'm going to drop this quick fire quiz. What's your questions? Throw them in the chat. Let's see. Or come on screen. We could do a couple. Who got a couple questions? What were some uh The first one, the first question kind of yeah. confused. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, with questions like that, um, so this is a good point. Uh, when you have, this is test taking tip. When you have these long patches, passages like this, um, this is how you approach them. You read the last, line, you look for the question. So the question is, what uh, interference uh, can you uh, make from this given scenario? You know, what can you gather from it? Like what's missing? What's the issue, right? So you read, you read the choices and let me see, let's go here, let's find one. Just use that as an example. So we read the choices, right? We got our answers. Um, 
collaborative project manager. The beta nav team has a robust communications plan. The project has an agile project. It does not have uh, change management. And uh, let me look. I have not read these in a while. Let me see what's going on here. Yeah. So, you know, she's trying to figure out, um, she wants to get something change. The client wanted something change in the blueprint. And so she called a team meeting. Anytime you take the team away from project work, that's a bad thing, right? In PMI world, that's a bad thing. Never take your team away off the work to solve a problem because it's your responsibility as a project manager to be the um, boss lady or boss man and be the man or woman of all knowledge. You're supposed to be looking ahead for issues like this and you can solve them without having to pull the project team off the work. So anytime you see a scenario where you're pulling the project team off the work, that's bad. So you need to look at what's the problem? Can I solve this myself? And nine times out of 10, you should be solving it yourself because it's your job to negotiate. You're the liaison between the sponsors and the stakeholders, not the project team. You're their barrier. If you're a scrum master, scrum master's job is to remove all impedance, right? That's the scrum master's job. That's the project manager's job. You supposed to part the Red Sea so the project team can do their job. So anytime you become an impedance, um, you're pulling them away uh, from there. So uh, Burdick has it that needs a project. Uh, she doesn't have a change, change control plan, uh, but it's a lot of text to unpack. So that's that's my recommendation when you go in uh, with these questions. Uh, anybody else? Uh, number two, yep. I got one, uh, uh, number, number eight. eight. Number eight, going with what you just said, seems like the product owner would be the one who controls it as opposed to the Agile team. Because um, the team can talk about... Uh, number eight? Okay, yeah, number eight. Question. The team can talk about changes and whatnot, but they don't eventually get to make the decision as to what changes make it in and what don't, unless it's um, during a sizing. So maybe I'm not understanding what type of change is being talked about. So where? Somebody tell me where change control I, I, change control board change control board is associated with to which approach of project management. Predictive. It says agile. Predict. Uh, no, it's not agile. No, no. Uh, you you said predictive. I said, said predictive. Predi yeah. That's what I said. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. But it's it said not yes. agile. But it says right here, the person or group responsible for evaluating change on an agile project is. Oh yeah, yeah. So I was I was Before talking about. Question, um, continue, Brandon. Oh, so, sorry, Abby. Uh, I was talking about A and B. Were you talking about uh, C versus A? Um, what you what what what, what uh, answer did you pick? So I, I was picked, talking about C. Yeah, I picked B as the answer, um, but the it looked like the correct answer is A. And um, then what you were yeah. talking about with C, um, that one definitely can't be the right Yeah, answer, I thought so that's, that's what you picked. So the reason why is not B. So before you answer the question, let, let, let me answer let me, the question. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me get this. Let me get this. Let me get this. Okay. So we're in an agile environment, right? So tell me in an agile environment, who is it? Does the project team have more? authority to make changes in an agile environment or less authority uh, in an agile environment versus a predictor? In an agile environment, the team is self-organized. Let, let, let him, let him, let him, he asked the question. Let him, let him talk it through. 
I, just, I, just, just, I guess just the question say. is what type of change? Because I was thinking a change, like an external change, um, or additional work adding to the scope, or something like that. So, if, so in a predictive world, like I mentioned, we're project with a with the project management change control 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 board. When there needs to be a change, the project team doesn't evaluate that. A change request is created. It goes to the project manager change control board, and they tell you whether or not you can do it. In an agile environment, that's not the case. The project team, because they have that trust and authority with uh, 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 the sponsors, and and more so in a in an agile environment, depending on that's why I suggest you guys go and read the agile practice guide. Because now we're talking agile and scrum. Because in the scrum world, the product, the product owner is actually part of the team. And they're working together to evaluate change on a project. Because they have, in the agile world, you are given more authority with your team to make changes on the fly because it's expected. Mm. Thank Does that you. make sense? Yeah. Go read up on that. And that's those are trigger words. And that's why I say that lexicon is very important. Uh, and if you're left or right, you're going to miss it. And that's a uh, that's a predictive term. We talked about it going through the process groups. Cool. That's that's uh some of you. Um I hope you well, I'm gonna open up some more time slots and let's do some one-on-ones. Um, and, and if you see where your errors are at, um, you could take some time to go back and review and correct them. Somebody raised their hand. Okay, go for it. Yeah, I, I want to ask you, so uh, so is, it, is the reason why that uh, question 8A, uh, uh, is, uh, is the reason the answer is A, because they say that uh, uh, the project team is self-organizing? So I don't understand because I just want you to explain what that what that uh, statement means. For which one? In, uh, in, in agile, this in agile practice, they say the project team is self-organizing. This team is self-organizing. So does that mean they can make a decision on the fly, like for a change, like that question eight was asking? Yes, yes, yes. And the reason why they're able to do that, not just because of them making it on the fly, because they have the sponsors and the customers are in collaboration. So that's the whole mindset. When if you go back to the, the, the four pillars and the 12 principles of Agile, Agile is promoting collaboration with everybody and taking away impedances and all the bureaucracy of paperwork, right? So th that's why we're working in these short sprints. That's why um, uh, uh, we're, we're minimizing how much work and just focusing on you know, a short bad product backlog and organizing it. But the product owner, uh, and, and, and that's why I say go back and review your agile concepts because, you know, in Scrum and Agile, the product owner is part of the team, right? That's, they're part of the team. They're the ones who are controlling that product backlog. I think I got a couple of Scrum masters in here. If you remember that through training, the product owner there is there controlling throwing that backlog and advising the team and they're collaborating back and forward. And uh, yeah, you, you exactly what you said. Now I won't say more authority, but they have a more of a leeway to make changes uh, because it's expected. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Yeah. If you, if you, if you understand the discussion, if you're not go back to your uh, practice guide, and I read that because in some of the, even in this book here with Rita, uh, they, they don't really go into those things like that. So if you if you want that deeper understanding, um, it's 90 something pages, uh, go through it, take, it's, it's not a whole lot, it, it's not hard reading, it's pretty easy, it's dry, you might need to throw some water on it, but um, go in and put your eyes on that. And so when you see it on a test, a question, you know where to go to reference it, right? And that's why I tell you to review these so you could see these things and know what you, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, it's also in seventh edition. 
But I think the best source is the agile practice guy. Uh, uh, Because they're both in play. Seven edition, yes, it's in there. But I think the way they put it together in in the agile practice practice guide by itself, you could just go straight there and just read through it and get what you need to get and then move on. Um, Cool. Uh, You may have access. Yeah, if you have, uh, did did they purchase membership for you guys or you just have a free account? With PMI. Yeah, Chris, this is Juliet. We don't have access to that yet, I don't believe, because we haven't been given our PMI. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Do we have access uh, to one? Do you have one? You yeah, I have one. I could get I could I could get let me see. Let me work on that and I'll talk to Jay and see if he could get you guys uh um oh I send you some resources so you could go and read up on those. How about that? I could do that. Um um, um, you could go there and read up on that. You, actually, you could go in either through YouTube. Uh, there's a lot of good videos out there. Um, you know, the Agile Manifesto, you know, uh, Agile Project Manager. Watch a couple of those. Those would be good for you and and, and get smart on these terms because the terms are different uh, and, and they intermingle with each other. So go and watch a couple of YouTube videos on that. And that should get you right up to speed on what you need to know if you don't have access to that book. This is where we're at. Uh, this is the end of, we didn't have a whole lot today. And I know it's getting late um, here. Um, so I'm being considerate of that because after a while, we're just talking, you guys just listening to me. So. This is the homework and what you're gonna do, let me let me bring it up so you can see it. I have it up over here, let me stop, let me see. You guys can see that, it's a pin by God. This is gold back here for you. Uh-huh. And if you're trying to remember why I say learn the concepts, this is where you come and do some deep reading and understand the concepts. So this is the appendix in the back of your Pinbot guide six, go back here, and this is where they lay out these concepts um, at a high level. Not a not a lot of deep reading, but it just goes into a breaking down the main concepts of what's going on as it pertains to process areas and agile and the process groups, what we covered. Uh, you could go back here and, and get an understanding of what's going on in each part. This is the part that breaks down the knowledge areas, uh, each knowledge areas, and give you the key concepts, uh, letting you know what's going on, right? So go back here and read this. If you, on that 10 day or that 21 day, as you're working through, and I'll touch on that. One way to break that up is the first 10 days, go through each knowledge area. Day one, integration. Day two, scope. Day three, schedule. Day three, four, cost. You know, you go through it like that, right? And you're practicing and you're testing. And so in 10 days, it should take you to get through. Now you have about 20, 19 days uh, or so to work through taking more practice exams and seeing what you don't know and going back and doing some more deep reading, either here or in your study guide that you have. You could go in here and do it and use this to help you do less reading. Because like you see, key concept for scope right here. It's like five lines of text versus 20 pages and a bunch of diagrams. But this is giving you the nitty gritty, right? This is giving you the high level of what's going on in each. So run through these, uh, get get these down, read them. I want you to read them. Don't review this. Sit down, get you a glass of wine or club soda uh, and and read this. (laughs) All right, Tom, he's already started. Uh, same thing here. Uh, 
summary of prior uh, of tailoring considerations for knowledge areas. And tailoring considerations, they're going to talk about, um, for example, project scope management. They don't do a really good job in six about this, um, but they do give you some insights what you should be doing. It says, oh, for agile approach, when it comes to scope management, does the organization use agile approaches in managing projects? Is the development approach or interim or incremental? Uh, is it a predictive approach? Just a bunch of questions for you to think about, right? So that's what they're trying to get you to do is just think about how you could incorporate some agile into a project. And, and this is from a perspective that you are working in your organization as an employee, not as a test examiner, exam, you know, a, a person uh, examinee, right? That's where this is coming from. So don't uh, just think about those things when you are studying and look at those in your book. So these are the items I want you to go over uh, in your homework. This is the other part, the tools and techniques. This is the section where you could come, I mentioned this before, and you could look at everything, how it's laid out by each knowledge area, right? You see integration, you see scope, you see schedule, quality, resource, so forth. Each one corresponds to tell you what section it is, so you can easily go back and find out what's going on. So these are all the tools and techniques, interviews, market research, surveys. Um, all of these are tools and techniques. They're not separated, but they just got them all in order. And so if you're just curious about what all the tools and techniques are, this is all of them right here, tools and techniques. Active listening, emotional intelligence. These are the type of things, lexicon wise, that you will see in choices on the exam. Right? So go back here, review this every couple of days, review it, review it, because if it pops up, you, you're like, oh, I've seen this before. That's that's your problem, is that you don't see enough things. So when it shows up on a test or a quiz, you don't understand it. Right. Um, so this is one way to get familiar really quick with all the tools and techniques versus going to each knowledge area and looking at each chart. You just get to go down and review them all along with page uh, 559 and page 25 with the process groups. So these three tables, I think, is key uh, for you to help you out. Um, to help you out on uh, the, the, the exam. Let me see. All right, cool. So, um, any questions? Oh, uh, I sent, I, I have the link. Uh, I have the link in there. It's in the folder. If you go in that folder where the documents are, there's a folder that says case studies. I dropped it in there. Um, if you don't have it, let me know. I can put it in the chat for you. But um, it's a short one. Just read it, answer the questions, and just take some time just to look at it. Because one thing you don't get by just answering questions out the book and reading stuff, you don't get any way to uh, uh, put this all these concepts together. So that's what these, that's why I give you these case studies. So you could just look at them and see what real world problems are. And then if you come across a scenario on the exam, it just makes it easier. Like, oh, like the one we have for question number one, that's what the, some of those case studies look like, you know? Um, so that's the homework. And that's what we talked about today. Old mouthful, but this is it, guys. You got to be intentional and deliberate about this. Um, so, um, uh, if you're ready to go, you're free to go. If you don't have any questions, um, uh, um, I will see you and I will send you standby for an email from me in the next 24 hours 
about Friday and your assignment would be in there uh, for you to do. So just plan on doing some reading and uh, getting your study plan together uh, based off of what I gave you tonight. And, and just treat your study plan like a project, you know? Just lay it out, schedule it out. That's, that's what they always say. Treat this study plan like a project. You're going to be project managers. Use the knowledge that you have and the knowledge you're trying to gain to help plan out your work. Cool. Y'all have a good night. And uh, those of you who want to hang around, I'll be here. It's, it's a good one. Some of you guys already, I see two of you on here that I talked to this weekend, but uh, I'm going to put this in a video because it's still recording. I forgot to talk about something. So we're still recording. Uh, it's still going live. Let me fix my blurry background so you can see this. Uh, it goes back to one of the pitfalls why people fail because they want to use a lot of free equipment. Uh, study items, 20 bucks. This is like the cliff notes of all the information that you probably need to know, all the concepts. This one is by a guy called Andy Crow, the PEMP exam. If you go to Amazon and Google it, you'll, you did like 20 of them. Um, and, and you can go and get one of these uh, from there. So they're like 20 bucks. Uh, but everything you need to know as far as concept, like, you know, the approaches to project management, all the key terms, all the key concepts in each knowledge area, they're all in here. It's all on this sheet. So I say go get one of these so you don't have to lug the book around. And this is a good tool to have while you're like testing. It was like, oh, I got that one wrong. So let me go here really quick and see. Okay, I understand why, you know, you could. And if you need to, then you could go to the book, right? So this is how we could study smarter and not harder and use up a lot of brain cells. Um, but yeah, quick guide, quick reference guide. This is golden. I use it when I'm instructing because, man, it's, I, I, I can't keep up sometimes. So I just look on here before class and this gets me uh, going and refreshes my memory. So go and get one of these. If you yeah, watch I this, get one of those. I want them. Uh, 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 go, to, go to Amazon and look for Andy Crow, a quick reference guide. I think it's about Andy 20 Crow? bucks. Yeah, quick Andy Crow. Guy. Yeah, let's see. I ordered mine yesterday and I already have it. <laughs> you know I why because she, Chris. <laughs> she was had a one-on-one -on -one with me i was like you need this <laughs> so yeah go and get one it's worth the 20 bucks it'll save you some headaches and when i say don't let it out your face when you wake up in the morning you should be like all right that's how you should be in the morning brushing your teeth you're drinking coffee right here Put it in your purse or your backpack. You got 10 minutes at work. You sitting on a train, whatever. Right here. Just keep this with you. That way you don't have to carry that big book around with you. But you got to keep this in your face and, and stay, stay, stay in the zone. Stay in the zone. Let me see. Anybody got some questions on here? Y'all on here. What y'all doing? Who, who got some questions? Nobody? Jasmine, you okay? <laughs> I, do. I do. Um okay. for what fashion is that? Is this sister edition? Um it's uh 2021 is the one I got on okay, here, but it has yeah, it has a it has the agile concepts on here. I think it's uh, the sister edition. Thank you. Yeah, it is six. Yeah, yeah. I see it right here. Six edition. Six edition. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Is it best like to know like um back to back for each knowledge area to know exactly the inputs and outputs 
for each one. Like, uh, for example, integration, um, it has, you know, the environmental, the organization, and a few more. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to figure out a way to retain all the inputs and outputs for each knowledge section. For each knowledge section? Example, well, I don't know if it's going to be on the exam or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is what I would say. I'm going to give you... I'm gonna give you. I'm um, first. I'm gonna say yes, and then I'm gonna tell you how to do it. Yes, you need to. You need to be familiar with all of them, right? But no, don't try to sit there and memorize all of them. It's just too many of them. Most of them repeat. That's why I point out what you should be looking at is looking at which ones are popping up. EEFs, OPAs, uh, you know, there's, there's not going to be too many that are going to be straight direct, but that's why over a course of a time and space that you go through and you review that list. So that's why I gave you that list to show you all the tools and technique run through that. So you kind of get familiar with, if you can remember 40% of those tools and techniques, I think you'd be okay because you use them over again, like meetings. Expert judgment is one that pops up a lot because you have to use your knowledge as an experience as a project manager as a tool to make a decision and assess something. You're like, okay, cool. Okay, now, uh, and so those things that pop up, as far as the inputs and outputs, you the best way to, to go at that is spend just spend some time going through each of those chapters where you have that page that shows the diagram um, with, with, with the inputs and output. And I'll show you really quick. Um, here is, here's cost management. As soon as you open up the chapter, you have this page. And it has all the processes, what the tools and techniques are. So if you want to study processes and inputs and outputs and tools and techniques, just go to every knowledge area and look at this page. Don't even read the book. Just look at the page and see how the flow is. Once you understand what's going on in a knowledge area, all right. So don't don't, what Chris, say don't. Print it out. Um, uh, what's that? What's the number on that page? I'm gonna print it out. I have my printer. Wait, right no. Here. There's one for each knowledge area. So you got to go to each okay. knowledge area and look at it. Another thing that you will see is you'll see like this, there's a diagram. So this is plan cost. So you'll see the process, you'll see the inputs. And then once you do the process, you'll see what the outputs are. So as you go through this, you could look at the diagrams and not have to worry about the reading. And you can see the, what goes in and what comes out. And there's one for each process in this book, right? Uh, some of the study guys do it. I think Rita, let me look at hers. Um, she does it. She does it a little bit in here. Uh, she does the same thing. So if you have this book, um, you will see the same thing. Um, uh, you'll see the same thing. Um, she has diagrams in here to show the flow of, uh, the processes. So yes, you do need to be familiar. Familiar means just be aware of what they all are. Um, get a good, get to learn, uh, a good, Mounted them through reading and reviewing, and you'll be okay. But you, there's other things you need to focus yourself on because it's not all ITTOs, you know. And that's one of the downfalls is that people get sucked in, burning a lot of energy. Uh, and you'll see that when you're doing those practice exams, you, it'll start showing you what you need to really know. Okay. Uh, and I yeah. started using that technique that you told me about. Yeah. And I see a, a great, great improvement in yeah. the uh, uh, quizzes that I'm taking. So yeah, 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 that, yeah, is, yeah. that is really, really good. That's, that's how you work efficient. You know, you got to be efficient. Don't study stuff you already know. Right? Don't, this is a waste of brain power. Study, don't study stuff you already know. Um, so if you get it wrong, go look at it. Look it up. Read a couple of lines. Think on a little bit. Okay, I got it. And then we just move on. 
And so when you're faced with it again, then you can be like, okay, I've seen this before. And then you work through it and do your best process elimination, finding the right answer. And then uh, that's why it's practice. So the more practice you get, the better you're going to get at this. So when test day come, you'll be, you'll be all over it. You high confidence is what we want on test day.